it's a journey that we've been on in organ donation over the last decade or so and it's been my very great privilege to to play a small part in that and I'll start by taking you back to around 2008 2009 to three slides that I used when I opened a series of talks around the country um, and the slides were about a well-meaning doctor who went to work one day and as a result of what perhaps he did or perhaps he didn't do three people died now you'd think that would be a pretty serious thing uh, to have happened that day but he'd never met those three people who died and those three people weren't being treated in the hospital he worked in um, so his employers didn't notice and even if they had I doubt very much whether he or she would have been censured in any way whatsoever and that's because of course those three people were not on the books of that hospital they were on the books of another hospital because they were awaiting a transplant and the error if the doctor had indeed made an error was that he didn't recognize and realize the potential for org organ donation from a dying patient who was under his care and that's how I opened um, th these meetings um, t in 2008-2009 and why, you might ask, did, were we having these meetings? Well, we were having it because of the Organ Donation Task Force that was commissioned in 2006, that met every month for the best part of a year under the tremendous leadership of Elizabeth Buggins and Professor Chris Rudge, and who in January 2008 published its groundbreaking report. 14 recommendations presented to the four health departments, accepted, in full, I'm not going to go through all 14 by the way, um, accepted in full, a groundbreaking report. But we recognise that a report's no good on its own, it'll just sit on the shelf or be archived on a server somewhere. You have to implement the recommendations of the report if you're going to make a difference. So we recognise that we had to go out and sell the message of the task force report to the wider NHS. So that's why I found myself in those road shows eight or nine years ago, opening a session with those three slides and wondering what kind of reception I was gonna get from particularly the clinicians who were present. Why did we need a task force report? What was going on in organ donation and transplantation um, at in 2006 2007 when the task force was meeting well if you go to a transplant meeting you will always see a chart like this um, in green we've got the number of people on the active transplant waiting list sat by the phone waiting for a bleeper to go will today be the get the day i get the transplant that could save my life that could transform my life and the number of those people was going up year on year as we approached 2006. in contrast the number of deceased donors in the blue bars and the number of deceased donor organs made available for transplantation from them those numbers were stubbornly static. So the gap between those in need and the availability of donor organs was getting wider and wider and wider. And all sorts of things had been tried up until the task force, but it all seemed to be resistant to change. Now, for the utilitarians, for the transplant community, that was enough. That was a re reason enough for a call for change. For others, it was more the human story, the heartbreak stories. And if you go into the media, you can find countless accounts of desperate plights, people waiting for a tra transplant to save or transform their life. Here's Robin Tainty. If you sat at the front, you might just be able to see the nasal specs. She has end-stage cystic fibrosis. Um, she's part of a charity, Live Life, Give Life. And she's speaking at an event in the House of Lords. There's so much more I want to do with my life, but I'm only too aware of the huge shortage of donors. I'm trying my very hardest to stay, stay positive 
and enjoy what is left of my life to the best of my ability, however limited that might be. Two months later, she was dead. And that what was, that's what was happening in organ donation and transplantation a decade ago. But still you might say, well, it's all very sad, but, what, but why should there be more donors? Why should there be more donor organs available? Where is the proof that this could change? And for me, the undeniable case for change came from data like this, where we compare our rates of organ donation in the UK using this metric of deceased donors per million population to those other countries with which we would normally compare ourselves. <laughs> How can it be that the UK has a rate of deceased donation and transplantation of 13 donors per million population when Spain have 34, when Belgium have 26, when Austria have 24, France 23, and so it goes on. How can we justify the status quo when the status quo is that we are towards the bottom of this particular healthcare league table? That, for me, was the undeniable case for change. Now, the task force thought and occasionally fought um, long and hard about where the root causes for the problems were. But we were all convinced that at least in part, part of the problem was in acute hospitals, with ICUs, with emergency departments. We thought that in those hospitals there were patients dying in circumstances where donation was a possibility, but where donation was not being recognized and realized as a possibility. We were convinced that most doctors caring for these patients were supportive to a degree of organ donation and transplantation, but it was often only to a degree when all the elements had fallen in place, when the doctors didn't have to make a donation happen, if you like, when all the ducks were already in a row. What we weren't sure about was whether every doctor would be prepared to force them or make a donation happen. Were they prepared to admit a patient from the emergency department into the intensive care unit, into the last bed perhaps, simply for the purposes of organ donation? Were they prepared to maintain or escalate critical care treatments in order to make the diagnosis of brainstem death and optimize a patient's condition for organs to be safely retrieved? Were they prepared to raise the possibility of donation with a grieving family, regardless of the circumstances in which their loved one had died? Were they prepared to embrace this, at the time, new model of donation, donation after uh, circulatory death, about which there were many issues and many uncertainties at the time? That's what the task force was struggling with. And the tax, to task force thought that we were thinking about donation in the wrong way. The task force thought that for too long, donation had been recipient-centered rather than donor-centered. They thought that for too long, we thought about donation as something that we imposed upon families, that we inflicted upon patients. And the task force said that was just plain wrong. The task force said that the majority of people in the UK wanted to do be donors and therefore had a right to expect that donation would be considered if they were dying in circumstances where it was a clinical possibility. So the task force said, we have to start thinking about donation as part of the care that we give to our patients when they are dying in circumstances that it's a where it's a possibility. Fine words, but fine words count for naught if they don't change practice. And we realized that we weren't going to change practice without having advocates for donation in all of our hospitals where a donation potential existed. So, and I think the most important recommendation we made was that we said every hospital had to have a clinical lead for organ donation, typically an intensive care clinician who would take up 
four or eight hours of his time to, to promote organ donation in their institution, supported by a donor transplant coordinator who were rebranded as specialist nurses, and I think rightly so, as specialist nurses in, in organ donation, who reported to a hospital donation committee that was chaired by someone who didn't shirk from asking difficult questions, particularly around clinical practice and the support that trusts and health boards were giving to their donation committees. Today, there are 210 clinical leads for organ donation in our trusts and health boards around the UK. There are 170 organ donation committees in those trusts and health boards. Those teams work locally. They work in regional, pra uh, regional collaboratives where they share, pra share practice. They come together every 18 months or so in our national organ donation and transplantation congress. We have a UK-wide network of donation leads and that is probably the envy of the world. What have they achieved? Well, in terms of systems, in terms of process, they have revolutionised how donors are identified and referred to the organ donation teams, the teams of specialist nurses, to the point where I think we no longer have to worry about donor identification and referral, particularly for donation after brainstem death. We have revolutionised the role that specialist nurses for organ donation play in the organ donation pathway. When we started in this, we used to ask the families for consent, and if the families said yes, only at that point would we invite the donor transplant coordinator to be involved. Now, we expect the coordinators to be present, perhaps even before brainstem death tests have been performed. It would be in many hospitals now unheard of not to be able to admit a patient from an accident and emergency department primarily for the purposes of organ donation. It would be unheard of not to consider donation after circulatory death in the same way as we consider donation after brainstem death. And frankly, it would be unheard of in many hospitals not to be making good use of the audit data that we continue to collect around the potential for donation in patients who die in our intensive care units around the country. The task force's thesis was essentially this. If we put all these resources into hospitals, clinical leads, specialist nurses, donation committees, if we train them, if we fund them, if we give them the right guidance, we should see donation put into the end of life care of more patients. We should see more donors. And they said, we're putting a lot of money into this, so we want to see some return. We want a 50% increase in the number of donors over a five year period of implementation. So here are the number of donors, baseline year 2007-8, which is when the task force report was, was published. So five years of implementation, a very modest increase in the number of DBD donors, that's donors after the diagnosis of brainstem death, but a very significant expansion of our DCD program. Did we hit the 50% target? It was 49.8% but graciously the departments of health allowed that to be rounded up to 50. I did however have a plan B and the plan B involved the fact that, that this financial year included the 29th of February. There were 366 days in that financial year and I was going to demand that the number of donors on the 29th of February in that year were extracted and then we would have hit the 50% anyway. Anyway, that wasn't necessary. We did hit the 50% target. The problem with hitting targets is that you then give another, another one, and we've set ourselves an even uh, more stringent target, and that is to rank now alongside the very best in the world. And we've set ourselves up into 2020 to achieve that. Where are we now? Um, in, in the last financial year, we had 1,413 donors compared to just over 800 in the year the task force published its report. It's unimaginable 
Sir Bruce Keogh, Professor Sir Bruce Keogh said they never really expected the task force to achieve anything. And that's what we've achieved. We're still further to go and we still don't match Spain and Croatia and others, but we continue to make improvements and the last percentage increase was around 75%. If you have more donors and you have more donor organ transplants and for almost every year um, we, we have reported an increase in number of donors and an increase in number of donor transplants, then surprise, surprise, the waiting list begins to fall. In 2012, if you look at um, uh, treatments for end-stage renal failure, five out of every transplants we, we perform are kidney transplants. If you look at treatments for end-stage renal failure, and they're essentially two, dialysis or transplantation, in 2012, transplantation, having a functioning transplant, became the commonest treatment for chronic end-stage renal failure in the United Kingdom. And that means more people living longer, it means people living a more productive life, a healthier life, and frankly, for the healthcare economy, a cheaper life, because immunosuppressants don't cost, cost as much as dialysis, not by a long chalk. We are the world leaders in donation after circulatory death. People now come to us, it's unheard of. People now come to the UK to learn how we do donation after circulatory death. We've performed 40 heart transplants from DCD donors. That is more than the rest of the world put together. And we've been able to do this because clinicians who are members of this college, of the ICS and of FICM, have embraced this model of donation. But, Anna, we have to accept that we are bit part players in organ donation and transplantation. We are not the main event. The main event are the donors and the recipients as well. And I'm going to leave you with a brief story about both sides of that. So this is a letter written by this girl, Caitlin, who's missing her dad. And she wrote it when she was nine years old. You can read it, and I'll try and read it for you. This is written to whoever is brave enough to read me. My dad, Gary, died last year. He was the best dad in the world. He was funny, he was caring, he was loving, and he was brave. My Gary Baldy Biscuit always put other people before himself. My dad isn't here to watch me and my brothers grow up but he gave all his organs to other people, so now other people will get to see their children growing up. I miss my dad every day, but I'm so proud I was his daughter. Please put your name on the organ donor list so you can save lives just like my dad. There are times people come and say, Paul, how do you do this? How do you get so many donation leads into a room at a Congress Centre in Warwick? I say, it's, well, it's easy. You win over their hearts and their minds. Minds is easy. You just show them the data. It's winning their hearts that matters. Because if you win over someone's heart, then you will empower them to do stuff that they might find challenging. So if that doesn't win you over, I'll try you with this one. This is Elliot. Elliot developed a dilated cardiomyopathy um, within a few months of being born and he spent two years in GOS on this artificial um, mechanical heart down here. And his donor came along. And you might think that his family were just grateful that the operation had been a success and would take him off home and, and support him to get better. But no, his family wrote a letter, an open letter, to the London Evening Standard. And it was addressed to the donor family they've never met. Thank you, little angel. In their darkest hour, as you prepared to take your last breath, your family selflessly thought of others. While your wings were preparing for your flight to glory, they decided their own grief was not their sole focus. 
Instead, they chose to gift your heart to a stranger. They had no idea what battle he faced, who he was, where he came from. Their one intention was for life to flourish as your sands of time quickly slipped away. In that moment, they showed us, in a world full of so much pain and suffering, just how amazing humanity can be. Thank you will never be enough. Your family has given our family hope, a chance of a future, a chance of life itself. We will endeavor to uphold your honor and your sacrifice. Not a day will go by without remembering your unselfish nature. For every additional day enjoyed, we will make sure each moment encapsulates the vibrancy and quality of life you have afforded us. We promise to make you proud of your decision to donate. All I would say is that this college can be very proud of the number of its fellows who have changed the way we think about organ donation. Thank you.